Planet Boss. We're going to talk addiction. What do I know about addiction? Oh, I got the addiction personality right here. This guy. If one is good, that is probably better. That's how I roll. Which is really good when you need to, for instance, be a fighter. You want to do things because if you flip it a good way, you can really push yourself. The downside is the bad things, the vices, so to say, you know? Like I said, one is good, ten is better, and then it keeps escalating. So it's always been a problem with me. I always had it, but thankfully, I chose fighting for a profession. Well, I didn't choose it. It kind of came along, free fighting. Nobody knew what that was, and suddenly I started making money in Japan. Boom, there I was. Now, that got me in line. So the only, problems was, uh, the only problem was in between fights. In between fights, of course, I would go crazy for three days and I would start fighting again, uh, training again. The good thing is training and drinking and training and drugs don't really mix very, very well together. The problem is this, and a lot of guys out there have that, it's when you stop competing. Because now suddenly you don't get those highs anymore from people, you know, 15,000 people knocking somebody out, going crazy. It's kind of a good feeling. Working out really hard with good training partners, really good feeling, you know. And once you start partying but you don't have to train anymore, well, you're going to keep on partying, you know, because, you know, addictive personalities will actually do that. I talked to uh, Pat Militich. Pat Militich is a much smarter guy. He's chasing tornadoes. That's his way of replacing the high from fighting with a different high. So he doesn't go to drugs or to alcohol. Much smarter, per, smarter person than I was. Now, you also have to understand that I'm very blessed because in Holland, for instance, they don't have Vicodins and Norcos and all that stuff. Pretty sure they have it now. I remember my mother, she was given Oxycontin, but she was in extreme pain. And I remember she had 10 pills, little ones, like the thousand milligrams or the, the, the one, whatever it is, and she used one, only to, to go to the, the wedding of my daughter, my oldest daughter who lives over there. So, uh, but the old, the old guard, I'm telling you, those people are way tougher. Um, if it would have been available in Holland when I was young, that would have been a problem for me, I guarantee you that. Because once I came to America and I say, hey, it's a bike, oh, that gives you a good feeling, wait, let's drink a drink with it. Yeah, that's when you're gonna go wrong. So. Thankfully, I didn't have that problem. Now, musicians have that, other athletes have all the same problem. Once you stop doing what you're doing, what you get known for, you know, once your peak is over, uh, for, uh, musicians, they can keep fighting longer, or fighting, playing longer, they have a longer career. But for fighters and athletes, they don't, you know. And if it's a rough sport where you get a lot of injuries, well, you're already used to getting this. And that's how my whole problem started. First of all, let's talk about this, the addictive personality, I already mentioned it. I was drinking a lot. Drugs I wasn't doing a lot. I would do it, you know, cocaine. Uh, I would take a, a pill here and there. For me, it was more drinking, drinking a lot. Um, I go really fast into a story because I'm, I'm, now people know I'm a religious person. They go, how did that happen? Well, once you get attacked by a spirit, you go, whoa, 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 what? Yeah, trust me, I was the same as you. I never paid any attention to all that stuff until it happened. And uh, later, looking back on it, like the family saw her. My daughter can describe what she looked like. We found out it was a woman who passed away in the house later on, but she had it out for me, for nobody else in the family. I mean, I'd seen her walk. One time I thought I chased a person in the house and there was a curtain hanging in front of a door uh, post instead of a, a door, there was a thick curtain. And I came around the corner and the curtain flies up against the ceiling. So I kept sprinting because I thought somebody was in the house, nobody in the freaking house. Right? I've been physically attacked like five or six times in the middle of the night. Somebody goes, oh, when you get all locked down, they go, oh, street par uh, sleep paralysis. Oh, God, oh my God, that happens, that happens 24 years that it happened and nobody ever told me that. Come on, guys. Of course, at, uh, I, I, I've been thinking about that, what it was. The problem is with this, I will be awake. I will be awake, will be able to move, and suddenly I would lock in. But I was able to move. I could put my leg out of, out of the bed. I would try to pull myself out. I couldn't get up because somehow it was my upper body that was incapacitated. And I couldn't breathe because I would, it was like a very heavy person equally set completely on my chest. And the only way to get out of it was like mentally getting really messed up of getting angry. And then I would just shout a lot of profanity and I'd wake up and my wife would wake up. And she goes again. I go, yeah, again. And then I start challenging it. I said, do it again. But right when I go to sleep, every time you wait while I'm into, into the, the RAM sleep, you know, very tight, do it now when I go, you know, and then eventually I started exercising it. 
So I went to uh, the place where the curtain flew up. It was always cold there. It was a weird smell. I think she passed away there, uh, the woman, the older lady. And uh, that uh, for 45 minutes. I don't know why 3 a.m. in the middle of the night would be a good time to do it, but that was it. You know, don't come to find out that when Jesus passed away, it was 3 p.m. And at 3 a.m. is the demonic activity. It's the highest. And somehow it never happened again. So that was kind of a confirmation for me. Way more happened. I'm not going to go into that right now because that's not, of course, the only thing when I got back to the faith because much more stuff happened. But I'm just throwing it out there. It was very physical, and I think it was the woman. The woman being angry with me, she says, listen, you have this beautiful family here. And she was slapping me around. So that's what I believe personally happened. I don't think Father, for the rest, it was really bad. So I was drinking heavy, and I needed to stop drinking. And suddenly, I had a phone call from my old manager, Jeremy, and Jeremy Lappin, and he said, hey, would you like to fight again? I go, whoa, that's seven years ago, dude. That's been a long time that I fought. It's been three and a half years ago that I trained. I said, give me a week. Let me see what I can do in a week and how I feel. I said, who do you want me to fight? Uh, he says, well, you decide. I said, I decide, yeah. I said, okay, Hicks and Gracie. I would love to fight Hicks and Gracie. He says, he's too much money. We cannot pay for him. I said, okay, well, you decide. And he says, well, we came up with Kimo Leopoldo. I said, Kimo Leopoldo? I got to just hang out with him at the Pride Fighting Championships. You know, we went party a little bit, then we had some fun. He said, you sure he's okay with that? And he goes, yeah, he already said he's okay with it. I go, well, sure, if he wants to fight, yeah, let's fight him. Now, what they didn't tell me is that they told Kimo that I specifically asked for him, which wasn't the case, of course. So he was pissed at me, which I found out later. Okay, first of all, when I started training for a week, I realized, okay, I think I can do it. So I said yes to the fight. Now we had to go to the press conference. The press conference, the, the pictures, they had to make pictures for the posters and for the free billboard. I had my very first billboard. That was bad, badass. Um, when I met Kimo for the first time, last time I was partying with him. All, everything was nice and dandy. And now suddenly I said, hey, man, what's up? And he's looking at me weird and he shakes half my hand, doesn't look at me. I go... That's weird, right? So like, maybe he's nervous. I don't know. So I asked Jeremy Lepp, and I go, well, what's going on with him? He takes this fight really serious, right? We're freaking eight weeks out. He goes, oh, no, no, no. We told him that you specifically asked for him. I go, why would you do that? Yeah, I know, to get him a little angry so he, it's better to sell the whole thing. I go, dude, you should have done that. That's I'm going to tell him. He said, oh, please don't tell him. I said, okay, I will tell him later. Actually, it's better because if he believes that, then he will train harder, which is going to be make make the fight more interesting for me. So I, you know, I just leave it like it is. Whatever happens. So I started training. Everything went well. First week was hard. Second week was hard. Third week, I was already starting to get into it. But it's, it's amazing how your body works. And I took the fight because it forced me to stop drinking. Because my wife was going, why would you take the fight? I said, well, if I'm fighting, I cannot drink. I have to stop. So I, I realized, okay, I'm just going to stop that. I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, and it worked, but my injury started to come back slowly but surely. Like three weeks in, suddenly, first thing started. The worst one was my tendonitis. My tendonitis, it's not a tendonitis, but it affects the tendons. I don't really know the name anymore, what it is. It's right here, and it's right here on this arm. That really stopped my career, because once that happens, I'm going to be done. If it happens four weeks before a fight, every single workout, I have about 45 minutes to work out. And then I'm going to be in extreme pain for like two hours. I would lose weight from the pain. There's no pill made, pills that I can take for it because it's pain. And you don't want to start taking painkillers because that's going to hurt you. In the recouping process, I was already 42 years old. You want to stay far away from that crap. It's very important to stay far away from it. But, you know, more injuries started to come. And more injuries started to come. And, come oh, man, everything started to come back. So I needed a lot of uh, therapy. Uh, I mean, I was training, and I would go to therapy. I was training, and we go to therapy. I started to spend a lot of money. I remember a workout. We went to 7th Planet, or 10th Planet with uh, Eddie Bravo. He was teaching. I said, sure, I would love to be there. I was in this class. But I was with the tendonitis and the pain head. He must have thought that I was a complete moron. Because, let me tell you, if you are in insane pain, I could not receive any information. I was training with this big guy. Uh, I... I said, I just want to do reversals. I couldn't get them off of me. It was, it was a freaking nightmare. Everything was pain. I said, I'm sorry. Can I call you, though? Because I would love to train with you again because your body type is about the same as Kimo Leopoldo, and I would love to roll with you uh, at my gym. And he goes, sure. Yeah, because he had a 
field day with me. Well, he didn't beat me up. He was just trying to control me, which he could do very easily. But I told him I was in pain. I don't think that he thought um, I would be much better without the pain. But uh, after three days, he came back to the gym. And after that workout, let's just say he never came back. <laughs> because I just freak, blank, 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 blank. That's what happens when I don't have pain. I started reversing him constantly on the flop, on the flop. Didn't have a chance to hold me down. So I was back in the game, but I had to really watch out because every time I just triggers a little bit, I have an intense pain. So it keeps on going. I pop a rip out. I, uh, I pull a hamstring. Uh, my neck is messed up. My tendonitis is back. So it started all with one simple Norco. And from the one Norco went to the two Norcos. Now I remember on the day of the fight, they told me to bring everything to the fight that I was using. So I grabbed my bag. I was draining my ears for, an, uh, for a cauliflower ear, which you have to do with a really thick white gouge, right? Uh, gauge, whatever you call it, to so that otherwise you can't get the blood out. And I brought my pain pills, of course, as well, because they said, bring everything that you are using. So I brought it over there. I showed it to the athletic commission. They took it out. Everything is okay. And I said, by the way, I have a doctor coming in to the dressing room. Uh, and he's bringing some lidocaine. And just before the fight, he's going to inject me in between my ribs. Is that okay? And they say, sure, it's okay, okay. You have a name of the doctor, I gave him the name, everything was okay. So now the doctor comes in while I'm warming up and he wants to inject me and this, the, 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 what is it? Uh, somebody from the athletic commission stands there and he starts panicking and they go, oh, relax. I told these people. And they said, no, you cannot do this and he's got to get him out and this whole thing happened. They go, this is weird, I told you. Then, a time later, I got a, uh, uh, somebody from the IFL, the International Fight League, remember that organization? He, they told me that he was talking to the head of the Athletic Commission. And the head of the Athletic Commission said to, my, to the head of the International Fight League that they walked into the dressing room and they literally had to pull the syringe out of my chest. Okay, okay. That's a lie. So I called that guy. And then he, uh, he's, he wrote me an email back. And he wrote me an email and he said that he... I, I would be fortunate because that story would have been a big story. I go, are you stupid? We're shooting a documentary. I have the entire Atlantic Commission on camera saying that it's okay to bring the doctor in. Then I have video cameras in my dressing room filming the whole situation. The doctor walking in, not even be able to open his freaking pouch, pouch, whatever he had, and to do anything. So you're going to look like an asshole, not me. I mean, because you're spreading the word. That guy didn't even peck a needle out. I got it on video, dude. And then suddenly, of course, he became very friendly. Oh, you know you know what he said? He said, in my profession, it's always great because I meet great, uh, great fighters. But you, sir, you are a really great fighter. I go, okay, I go, stop it, dude. I mean, unbelievable. People sometimes are just unbelievable. But hey, that was just a story I wanted to uh, share with you before the word gets out again. Always make sure that when you bring things that you might think all people could be against, just videotape it. That's why I had all the video cameras with me. Everything on tape, ultimate proof, nothing can happen. Okay, so let me see, where are we? Doctor came in, took the fight starts. I had to do the fight. Now, in the morning, I took two Norcos because it says on the bottle that you have to wait at least eight hours. In my mind, that was, I'm gonna wait for the eight hours for at night because I want my mind to be clear. If you put a, a Norco in there or a Vicodin or whatever it is, it will slow you down. It's not really good for your thinking, especially not when you're fighting. So let's do it early in the day, you know, and then uh, be there. So after the fight, everything went well. I couldn't kick higher than a high kick. I remember the, the, the commentators were talking about, why doesn't he give a high kick? Uh, but I couldn't. The only kick I could give was a roundhouse kick to the legs, which is how I won my fight. Now, after the fight, like two or three weeks later, suddenly uh, I got a phone call that I tested positive. And I go, for what did I test positive? Because I don't use crap. And they say, you tested positive for a Norco. I go, dude, I have on camera, I told these people I was going to bring Norco, and they said it was okay to fight. And now it's suddenly a little, I had to pay a thousand bucks. Yeah, but you also, I also, uh, uh, what was it? Tylenol PM. I'm not kidding. Okay, there was not a penalty to it but I tested positive for a Tylenol PM that I took to go to sleep. Apparently, that's on a list that you cannot use. So this is just back information to let you show, to show you that uh, sometimes it's a big mess. Everything is a big mess. Oh, and, and let's go back really fast. Uh, Kimo Leopoldo, he tested positive 
for some steroids like a couple of weeks before the fight uh, so unfortunately I could not fight him he got replaced with Ruben Valerial Warpath was his name he's an Indian guy 265 pound guy very my heart thank you so much for picking that fight because all the guys like Dan Gabbard there were a whole bunch of guys who said oh I'll fight him I'll fight him as soon as they were offered the fight, nobody wanted the fight. It's really weird, right? Or they priced themselves right out of the gates, like I want a million dollars or something like that. So thankfully, Ruben Valeria stood up and uh, he got me. I remember Don Fry calling me and he says, dude, before the fight, that guy's got a hard head. I said, it's okay, Don. I said, because I put the rip out, I pulled the rip out, so I can't hit hard anyway. I will try a few times, but if I can't go, if I, after two or three shots, if I connect and he's not doing anything, I'll give him low kicks. If low kicks don't work, I will take him down and go for a submission. So that was the game plan. Uh, I hit him really freaking hard. During the fight, actually, we were talking because I hit him and he goes, Bob! And he goes, man, you're fast. I go, oh, thank you. And then we start fighting again. And then I hit him with a pretty good shot. He goes, ooh, and you hit hard. I go, not hard enough. You're still standing. So that's when I realized, okay, you know, I'm not going to waste any energy. Let's do some low kicks. I think it took me three or four low kicks. And then the fight was over. But I mean, by the boom, I remember Marco, who was standing outside the cage when I came down. And he says, congratulations. I go, dude, now I got the same one as you. Because he stopped Paul Verulens, remember? I believe in UFC 6 with low kicks. The polar bear is what they called him. So, now I'm uh, off the fight. And now, of course, I can also take painkillers after the fight. Because the fight is done. And I still have the pain. I actually have more pain from the fight as well. So it starts with two Nurkos. And everybody who uh, has an addiction, they know exactly what's, what's going to happen now, right? Two become three, three become six, it goes down. I remember the day that I wrote a nine on my mirror with my wife's uh, whatever stick is for pencil, whatever. And I told myself I was not going to pass number nine. No more than nine pills a day, which I already thought was a lot. Well, that became just insane amounts. So I went to the doctor and I said, listen, this is not good. And he says, no, you need to go to OxyContin. I go, but is that not super highly addictive? Everybody's talking about that crap. He says, yeah, but in the Norcos and the Vicodins is still a lot of uh, Tylenol, which is really bad for your stomach. He says, don't worry about it. I can prescribe it to you. I had no clue that I was one of those doctors because he was a res regular house doctor as well. But he just tried to sell, of course, pain pills. Well, it ended up with me taking... 8 till 10, 80 milligrams of OxyContin every single day. It went, it went bad. Then I went to Boston one time and I had to uh, do an autograph session for the UFC. You know, I wasn't competing anymore, but you know, they asked me if I could do it over there. And when I drove back, or when we flew back home, um, I had a five hour delay and I had no more pills. And I knew I had him in my car when I would arrive uh, at the LAX. And boy, that's what I found out. You know, you always know it, kind of. But since you have the pills, you don't experience it. But once you're on a plane on a five-hour trip and you're freaking shaking and you got goosebumps everywhere and feeling horrible, like you have a very bad flu, well, I knew I was addicted. So now I went to the doctor. And I said, listen, people told me about Suboxone. You know, for heroin, you use methadone and your Oxycontin. It's Suboxone. Suboxone is what they prescribe. In Holland, they prescribe methadone also to, to, to like uh, the, the heroin patients. It's the methadone bus, actually. They have a bus coming by. You see these people waiting, like on a bus, or bus stop. Not kidding. They made a song out of it. It became a, like a number one hit score, the most boring song. I'm going to put a link underneath. We're going to have to put that under there because you're going to have to hear that song. You cannot believe that was like the number one hit for like a couple of weeks in a row. It's the dumbest song, but it's the most hilarious song ever. Anyway, Suboxone is the way to go. So first of all, he didn't want to give it to me. And I said, no, you cannot have it. I said, you will give it to me. And then he got a little bit lippy with me. No, you're just going to do so I was a different guy, guy then. I put him up against the wall by his throat. And I said, doctor, you make me into a junkie. I would really, well, an addict. A junkie steals money, right? An, an addict doesn't do that. I didn't steal any money for my drug addiction. Uh, so he, of course, he would prescribe right away Suboxone. Now, what he didn't tell me, and maybe he was angry, or I don't know, um, that you have to really watch out with Suboxone. Suboxone and the amount of pain pills that I was taking, you cannot take too close to your last pill. You have to wait at least with the amount I was taking to be super safe, 
like 20 hours. 20 hours, you're already in a freaking detox. So you want to take it sooner. I didn't read that part. I read 12 hours. And from the 12 hours, I said, eh, I'll do an hour extra. I still feel okay. I felt, it yeah, didn't feel good, but I did. And then I took, I remember, what was it? One and a quarter I had to take, I believe, my very first time. But I figured I'd do one. And you put it under your tongue. And immediately I start feeling, oh, this that feels good. And then it happened. Then I got thrown into a full detox. And that's a side effect. So if you are kicking a painkiller and you're using Suboxone, guys, wait longer. Always better don't take it too soon. Really do your homework on this thing. I've never seen anything. I've never experienced anything like that's the most evil thing that I ever felt. It was almost like something living inside of me. I called my friend. I was on the phone with uh, 911. I could not even explain where I was. I was, tears came out of my, I wasn't crying. There's just water came out of my eyes on the sides. I, I, my, goose, my goosebumps looked like lizard skin. I've never seen my skin like it looked. It was standing up straight. It was really thick. Um, I'm freaking out. I knew a friend of mine was close and he would always carry pills on him. And I called him and he said, I said, where are you? And I said, I'm in Calabas. I only know the gas station. He says, I'm close by. I go, go down, go down. I need pills. I mean, he gave me 15 Narcos. And you should have seen his face. I took 15 Narcos. I drank it. Then I went into the uh, gas station and I started buying cigarettes. I never smoke. I smoked a long time ago. The nicotine. I, and he was looking at me. I go, look at my skin. Look at my skin. He goes, dude, you're going to freaking die. This is way too much. I go, no, 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 don't worry about it. And I start calming down. And I said, okay, now I'm going to need to, to learn that stuff to, to kick it the correct way. So, reset everything. I waited, I think I waited at least 22 hours. I mean, the people around me said, you can take it, you can take it. I said, that experience that I had yesterday is the most evil experience I've ever had in my life. So, what, for you to understand, if you're, let's say, three days in and you're OxyContin kicking without Suboxone, that's how you go. You go from zero to a full-blown detox. It's the most horrific thing you ever had. Um, but good, I survived. I got it. Now, okay, now let's start taking everything under control. Let's start slowing it down. So I start slowing it down. Every time a little bit less, a little bit less. You know, and, and what you also realize, you went, I started with one and a half. I remember one, no, one and a quarter. One and a quarter, that's like eight, what is it? Would be, Vivian says, ah, it's 10 milligrams of uh, Suboxone. But you can easily go to three quarters. There's almost no difference in that. I go, hey, that's easy. Then I went to a half a little bit more and from that moment on you go every time one eighth less one eighth less like really little tiny bits you go less but then I started feeling really bad and I remember one day my daughter had to uh, had a party at home and I was like four days away and I, I couldn't make it so I had to get back on it do the party and then I said okay now I'm going to really stop and I go methodically I'm going to cut it down I literally I went down with such a little pieces every time, every time, until I had one eighth. And then I remember I did one eighth every once a day. Then I did one eighth every day with two days in between. And then when I stopped, it was still 11 days of craziness. No, though, I was three and a half years on that stuff. The side effects that I had, why I wanted to stop, was I had a permanent double vision. I would always see everything double, not even able to see one. Uh, I wrote some things down. My heartbeat in the morning in bed was 93. When I wake up, it's like 51 now. It's a, it's a big difference. High blood pressure, sweating all the time, um, zero energy, falling asleep behind the wheel. I'm in the car, slapping my face dur during the day. During the day, just falling asleep in the car. In a the movie theater, I would fall asleep, but never fell asleep. It was completely insanity. I went to a doctor to see what was going on. They did a testosterone level uh, to see where it was. He came back with another doctor and they both sit at the table and they look at me and they go, how do you get out of bed? I go, what do you mean? He says, your testosterone level is five. I go, 500? Five. He says, a, a, a woman has 80 or 70. A guy under 100 they don't even want to go to work anymore. I said, somehow you walk around. How you do it? I said, I'll drink a lot of coffee in the morning. I can tell you that. But it's very hard. You know, I just force myself to do it. 
So that stuff, all this, this side effect that I had, it was just stacking up, going to pee seven, eight times at night, all the time, sitting down to pee, to be freaking, oh man, it's like five minutes sitting there because you can't get, the, I mean, everything is bad. Once I start cutting it, and I did that last one eighth of a part, um, the 11 days were hard. They were hard. So what I did, I, I took a lot of um, amino acids, a lot of water, a lot of electrolytes. I went to the sauna every day and I walked on a treadmill, incline walking, which I did not want to do because with a testosterone level of five, trust me, you don't want to do anything, but I just did it. You know, we don't always have to do uh, what we don't like. And I know also it will get me, it get out, gets everything out of the system a little faster. So we have to, so that was it. I just put it on, put it on and constantly, constantly keep, keep it on, you know, make sure that you never go back to it. That's the, the biggest thing. You know, once you into for five days, you never want to get it back and your senses start coming back. Your senses, man, you have no idea. I would, uh, I would be like Superman. And what I'm trying to say is this. You remember when Michael Shannon plays the bad guy in Superman, he's his nemesis, who comes from Krypton, but he comes here to, uh, to Earth and he's not, to use, uh, not used to all the sounds yet. And it's a lot because he got the super hearing, super everything, and he cannot channel it yet because it's only here on Earth. Superman was grown up with it. So he learned how to deal with that. He was, no, it was almost like that. Like people would do this. This sound was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Everything was super loud. I had to wear shades everywhere, even inside, because everything was so bright. Touching, smelling, hearing, everything was super, super sharp. So there you can see that whatever you're taking, the Suboxone is freaking killing you. And, the, and oh, the reason the doctor gave me Suboxone and put me on it, he said, because you don't have to take more and it will still help with your pain. Don't believe that bull crap. It won't, it does. Actually, when I stop at the Suboxone, that's when my pain disappeared. And another thing, what he should have told me is that if you do Suboxone, you should stop that within 10 days. Build it up within 10 days because the more you're on it, it gets into your bones and into your system. And then you're gonna have exactly what I had, like a testosterone level that's almost nihil, which is almost nothing, and you're gonna feel really bad. By the way, when they gave me my first testosterone shot to get back up, that's when I realized, oh, okay, so now I understand why fighters who get caught with steroids and especially testosterone, now I know why they do it because it's the most insane thing that I ever had. It felt like I was 20 years young again. I mean, I literally jumped to the gym and I started boxing and I started doing, I go like, this is insane. <gasps> so good you feel, but guess what? In two weeks, that good feeling is gone. And the only way to get it back is to use more than the last dose you used. You see, there's the addiction again. Every single vice has the same problem. So that's when I said, nope, I just want enough to get my testosterone level up to like 700 or something. No, but a thousand, you're gonna feel great. Don't even wanna feel great. I just wanna feel good, like normal. That's what I did. That took me till about two and a half, three years ago. And now, I'm clean from all, because I did TRT. I don't like to do TRT. I don't like to be dependent on anything. Not because it's TRT, if it helps you, it helps you. It's not, for me, it's always, I do always worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is war breaks out or, and now I can't get it anymore. And if I have to defend my family and I have to do it the way I was feeling with my testosterone level of five, I'm not gonna really be a, 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 a help for my family if I have to defend them or whatever happens. So I always think worst case scenario, what if I can't get it anymore? I need to get rid of this crap. So then I did a whole bunch of years ago, completely clean. I always have people talking to me and says, well, but you still look good. I, I weigh the same as when I started fighting. You know, that's the great thing about never using steroids during your fighting, because I weigh the same. And people go like, oh yeah, but so wait a minute, you said that I used when I was fighting? Well, then I have to use now, right? I mean, I'm the same weight. I'm 58 years old, guys. It's impossible to be the same way. So take the bet, any bet. So any person who says, oh, but the way he looks, he's on steroids, I'll take a million dollar bet. I'll take it right away. The only thing I'm taking right now is the weeder pills, which I don't get paid anything for. It's just weeder and it's the natural testosterone. So you, 
your own body producible. You can get them at GNC, you can get them anywhere you want. That's the only thing I take. And that's been taken only for like the last six weeks. I haven't even taken that before. So I just said, well, I tried that out one time. Nothing is always better, trust me, because you get used to everything. And that's the same with alcohol, but it's with good things, it's with bad things. People are weak. And when I say people, that includes me as well. We are weak. You know, we are very selfish as well. If you have a pain pill addiction, if you have a family or loved ones around you, and you don't, have, you don't want to stop, you're a selfish douchebag. That's what you are. That's what I've been for a long time as well. Oh, it's easy. Last time I was posting something um, about the Exodus 90, you know, 90 days, you can't do this. You have no alcohol, no TV, no. There's this whole list that you cannot do. And I said that, uh, you know, that you're going to man up, you know, and, and especially, you know, if you have an addiction, you can, well, you cannot take it. You have to be a tough guy. Uh, same as with alcohol. And I say it, I was addicted to alcohol. I tell it in the video that I'm posting. And right away I got an alcoholic reacting to me. He goes, oh, look at him, you're talking about alcohol, but you don't know anything about it. And I go, oh, I know exactly what kind of person you are. You're the guy who's going to say, oh, but I'm one of the 10%. Uh -huh. That's the same as me, dude. I have that too. I get the gene, you know, everything is addicting to me. That's why I don't gamble. That's why I don't do anything else because I will go full in with everything I do. I said, but you're, you're trying to use that as an excuse. The only way to get out of it is man up. That's it. Being a tough guy. Otherwise you can't get it out. All the millions, every addiction around the world who stopped it, manpower, willpower, nothing else. Oh, and get a little help here? Sure, get a little help there. That's okay. But it's, ultimately, it's all about you. What are you willing to do? And if you're not willing to do, you have a family, sorry, you're a douche. I'm sorry. Yeah, but it's an addiction. No, you cannot do anything. You can do anything about it because I could do anything about it. And millions of people have done things about it. So don't use that stupid excuse. Just stop. You know, and if you are addicted, don't say, let's stop uh, tomorrow. Why don't you stop today? And understand, okay, get one more high. You see, but that's the thing. One more high. So you are addicted. And you're addicted to that feeling. And if you believe that feeling is more important than the loved ones around you, you have a problem. And that is how I stopped all my stuff. Because I realized I was a douche to the people around me. Not a douche in because I'm a happy guy. But what if I die? What if I buy my drugs somewhere and I, get, I put myself in a dangerous situation? Driving and drinking. That happened, right? Everybody does that one time. Stupid. 100% stupid. Thankfully, nothing ever happened. You know, but you see, all these things can go wrong, and I can get an accident, and then I'm dead. What do you think your parents think, or your brother thinks, and, you, and your loved ones around you, your kids, your wife, your family? You know, so you are affecting the people around you, whether you like it or not. That's the most dumbest excuse there is. I do this in my talks. I talk about that. People say, yeah, but you know what? Because I was that. I was that person. I will say that in my talk. I was the guy who said, you know what? I, I don't do anything bad to other people. Everything I do, I kind of do to myself, you know? It's too much drugs, too much alcohol, you know? I don't bother anybody. You bother everybody around you. You're a selfish ass. That's what you are, you know? Just own it. Own it and start working on it. And I'm telling you, once you own it and you start working on it and you, you, you beat it, you're going to feel so good. You're going to feel so good. Everything comes back. Don't think, oh, I was that guy. I was. It will all come back. If it came back to me after freaking... 30 years of misusing everything there is out there, then it can go back to you as well. It's just building, making a new habit, and then sticking with it. And then if you start cleaning up your life on the other sides as well, we know pop freaking burgers all day long and pizzas all day long, why don't you do 80% good food and then sometimes you cheat a little bit with that kind of food? It's all about the willpower. Now, fortunately for now, all these phones and everything else it's killing it for us because we don't have the willpower anymore. Testosterone levels are dropping. I talked about this on the show before. You know that a 22-year-old right now has the same testosterone level as a 67-year-old had in 2000. If you're 22 or 25, chances your father has double the amount of testosterone than you have, 100% extremely high. Why is that? Oh, it's the food. It's not the food. Are you stupid? That's what they try to blame it on. It's not. It's we don't get challenged. We don't have cojones anymore. Everything happens online. I was in a fight with a kid. Tried to, well, in a fight, he tried to be angry at me. Didn't even look at me. He's one of those guys on the phone. On the, on the, but then in, in a real fight, oh, they're not used to that. So he's like, oh, you know, what are you doing? He didn't even have the balls to look at me. 
That's the world we're living in right now. It's all going down the drain. Oh, I need to lose weight. Pop a pill. I can't sleep. Pop a pill. Heartburn. Pop a pill. Blood pressure. Pop a pill. You name it. Everything is popping a pill. Cholesterol. Pill, 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 pill. You know how we are designed? This is weird. Because if you eat healthy and, 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 and live clean, oh, everything disappears. How would I know that? Because all those stupid pills that I just mentioned, I was thinking. I was that guy because after I'm in pain and I can't work out anymore, you think I'm going to work out? No, I'm eating burgers. Oh, cholesterol is up. I'll take a pill for this. Blood pressure. I took all that crap. And then once I start realizing it was me who was wrong and I start cleaning up my life and building new habits, now I don't take anything. Everything is gone. It's weird, right? It's like almost God designed us so we can heal ourselves. Mm, that would be good. So try it. You know, man up. That's what I tell the people. And it's with every vice out there. doesn't matter. If you're angry the whole time, that's a vice. Kick it in the butt. And the only way to do it is to constantly... Why do you think I have a rubber band here? What do you think this is for? This is for when I... For when I get angry. Or somebody cuts me off and let it go. Poof. I just... Physical pain to stop it. It started with profanity. I just decided I don't want to do profanity anymore. Oh, you know... What the, does it matter? Isn't that cool? You don't think it's a better example for kids to not use profanity at my age? Why would I do that? It's kind of, you know, listen, I'm okay with it dropping an app bomb here and there, good. But those effing guys who've effing this and effing that, every freaking sentence, really? I see it as an insecurity. And if it's an insecurity, eh, I don't like to be insecure. Why would I stop? Why do I need it? Stop it. You know, and once you start doing it, I go, oh, that worked pretty fast. Because you're feeling this. I'm feeling it already now, just the three times that I did it. And I used to be a professional fighter. It's just the things that you're not used to. But if you can do it with this, you can do it with everything else as well. It's just making yourself aware of it, that you're a pussy, not a pussy, a pussy. And I took that, I, nobody else, from the word pusillanimous. And it means lack of courage or determination. You're a pussy. And that's what I literally tell myself if I don't want to do something. I give you another hint. Every morning I'm in the gym. I'm working out. Do I want to work out? Nope. I don't want to work out. I really don't like working out anymore because everything hurts. But I do it. You know why I do it? Because I know that if I, first of all, if I'm halfway in, I'm kind of enjoying it again. It's only the beginning. But I also know that if I don't want to do something and I still do it, now I just not only make myself physically strong, but also mentally strong. It's good to do things that you don't want to do. We all try to avoid, oh, problem there, oh, okay. oh no, delete him, don't, don't talk to him anymore. Oh, don't. No, don't do that, face it. If you face a problem head on, it's not a problem anymore. If you avoid it, it will always come back. It will always come back. And this counts for everything. You know, watch that tape on uh, Instagram when I talk about the Exodus 90. 90 days cold showers. I didn't like it in the beginning. Now, well, 20 days in, 25 days in, it's nothing. It's like, oh, whatever, it's the same. Now, Grant, I don't live where it's uh, minus 20 somewhere. Here's just zero. Well, what, 33 is that here, right? Uh, it's, it's zero degrees Celsius. It's 33 Fahrenheit. So it's not that crazy. But you can do exactly the same thing. Like I have a cousin of mine. He said, oh, I tried to call shower. There's no way on hell that I can do it. Serious? I, I, I will be embarrassed saying that. There's no way on hell you cannot do it. That's a pussy, right? Right there. Of course you can do it. It's just doing it. So what you're saying is that if gas and electricity falls out, you can't shower anymore. That's what you're saying. Yeah, well, then I guess I have to. It's, it's like the guy saying, what is the one thing you cannot go without? And the one guy said, coffee in the morning. I go, no, no, no. What is the one thing you absolutely cannot go without? He says, yeah, coffee in the morning. I don't even want to talk to you anymore. That's the biggest pussy on the planet. Really? So you can't wake up without coffee? If you're forced to? Like there's no coffee, there's the end of the world. Oh my God, I can't have coffee. This is the world we live in, guys. Everything is online. Oh, I want my food? Let's call it. Don't even want to jump in the car anymore. It's too much work. And then everybody says, oh, Mike Dolce. You know, Mike Dolce is a great coach with food. Also, he has the best. People say, yeah, I don't have uh, 45 minutes an hour a day. He goes, hey, can, can I see your phone? Or look it for me, and he goes to the screen time. And he goes, oh, today, uh, was, yesterday was seven and a half hours, and today he says, hey, wait, you said you had no time? And everybody drops their head, he says. 
because they realize you do have the time. And if you don't have the time, make the time. Why do you think I'm up at 5 o'clock a.m.? You think I like that? No, but once you do it, you get used to it. I, I don't even put an alarm anymore. I wake up. I do my ritual first. You know, prayers, I do meditation. 6 o'clock, I'm in the gym. At 6 o'clock in the gym, first thing I do, my breathing. The, 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 the O2 trainer. That, and I post this every day. So people go like, oh, you start doing it. He's just saying that. Boss Rutten's O2 Bootcamp. Go to that Facebook page. It's only for O2 trainer users. You know, for people who enjoy breathing. And you will see me post every single day videos of me doing the breathing exercise. Then I do my workout, which I don't post because it's boring. Right? And then at 7 o'clock, I'm already walking the dog. You know, and then I eat. I, get, I have already, when everybody starts waking up, I'm always already three hours way up. And I did a lot of work. It's the only way for me to get my workout in there to do whatever I want to do. If I don't do that with my freaking ADD, well, I can schedule it at 1 o'clock, but if God forbid something comes in between, then my whole mind, because that's my mind, you know, I have to reorder, reorder, restructure. And it's hard because I need all these habits and patterns that I have to work with because otherwise I get out of control. It's a hard thing to control still, till this day. But I can, as long as I stick with my habits. And that's it. That's the habits is 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 the way to kick any any addiction, anything, anything being good. Uh, magnanimity. How many times do I say that word on this show? That's really where you always should strive for. Striving for excellence. That's what it means. Why not? Why would you go half ass? If you do something, try to commit, and be be honest to yourself. If you tell yourself that you're not going to do something, don't do it. You know what I said to myself hundreds of times. Every morning, today I'm not going to drink because I woke up in a hangover. At 2 o'clock, 1, 2 o'clock, that's my first drink again. I broke that promise. And once you break that promise, the next time it's easier for you to say no. And if you've been doing that for a year, you don't even think about it. You say, ah, no, tonight I'm not going to drink anymore. While you're saying it, you know you're going to break the promise. You know, now you're lying to yourself. You know the last person in the world you should be lying to? is yourself. It really is. Because that, that's how addiction starts. But if you're true to your word, to your own word, you say something and you do it, people are going to love you, first of all, because once you commit, you commit. But also yourself. You're going to wake up in the morning, you're going to feel much better. Now I did what I did. How many times you wake up, I should have done this today, or tomorrow I do it. And, then, and they, it's, it, that started six months ago. And then one day you do it. And how good do you feel? And you go, dude, I could have done that six months ago. You know, it's the same as this. We had a shower head in our, uh, in our apartment. And, and it, it would literally, my wife bought it online, this crazy thing with like special showers out. But the water would fall out, you know, like, like really like. And I'm trying to catch the, the, the water coming down. And it's super annoying, super annoying. Then I don't know why, for like a year and a half or two years, we're using the freaking thing. Then one day I'm just, I said, hey, this is it. Just get somebody else and put, put something else in because I, I don't want to do this anymore. I went back. Uh, I, I did something for Karate Combat. I came back from a trip and my daughters were texting me. goes, oh, you're going to love the shower. And it was, it came out, you know. I go, I could have done that two and a half years ago. But I didn't. Somehow we get comfortable. Okay, I can manage. No, don't manage. Make it good. Yeah, but it's going to cost time. And, you know, I don't have the time right now. Make the time. Tomorrow, wake up, freaking an hour earlier, do it, and you're, done. and you're going to be so happy every single time you shower. And it's just with showering. And it's the same with food. Prepare. If you're like me, you wake up in the middle of the night and you want to eat, you know, make sure you got healthy food inside, in the house. It's important because otherwise you eat everything what you see. Chocolate, whatever it is, is bad. Healthy food. You see, preparation is the key to success. It's very simple stuff. We all know this, or we don't do it anymore. And that's why Exodus 90, if you look at it, uh, just Google it, Exodus 90, and see the rules that you have to do. I mean, if you can't watch TV, you can't watch movies anymore, you, you can't drink alcohol, you have only three meals a day, you can only take cold showers, you have to work out every single day. You know, all this, you can't be on your phone. You can only be on your phone for business, for your business. For the rest, you can't be anything. And now you go like, wait a minute, I can't binge watch uh, freaking Peaky Blinders, Love that show. You know, I can't. I can't do anything. Okay, what am I going to do? Oh, let's read a book. I always wanted to learn this about this, about this. And then you start doing that. It's everything, guys. 
coming up for yourself and just being a good person. You're going to love yourself first of all. You look in the mirror, you see a guy, okay, I kind of like that guy. But it's just doing it. And throw the pussy card away, or the pussy card, whatever you want to call it, it's kind of the same. And man up. That's what we're doing. And women, we man up. We man up. You can do the same thing. Women mentally are much stronger though than guys. You know how I know? Uh, what is it? Uh, Naked and Afraid. You watch that show? When you hear the title, you never watch it, you never want to watch it. My wife told me one time, you got to watch this thing. So they throw you three weeks with a partner, a guy, a person you never met before, a male and a female, naked, in, in the jungle, wherever. You don't know where you're going. You can also go to the snowy, they give the Amazon, the craziest places. And you get, get one tool, like for instance a knife, or maybe you want to have a bottle where you can put water in. But this, fire starter maybe, because you need to have clean water. If you drink bad water, you're going to get really sick. And now, good luck, three weeks there. And most of the time when people quit, it's a guy. The women almost never quit. It's, it's, a, it's amazing, you know. I love to watch that because every single time the tough guys are in, and there's some guys freaking jacked, and they're the first to pussy out, to pussy out, lack of courage and determinations, uh, determination, but the ladies, they keep hanging in there, so uh, good for you ladies, good for you, now, that's why I also actually believe it, oh, I don't know about that, that looks to me, I don't know, I cannot say, but uh, I'll say it, but I, I never checked that, it looks to me that there's more male addiction than female, because if I look back, I know a lot of guys, but I don't know a lot of women, so I wonder if that something has to do with that, because they're stronger willed. Let's figure it out. Let's jump on the Google machine. <laughs> Godspeed, everybody. I hope you learned from something from it. Uh, if you are in a bad position right now, you are doing it. You don't want to hear your pussy. I understand that. I didn't want to hear it too. But for me, it was only the only way to get myself out of it. When I realized that, it was, that I was enslaved to whatever I was taking, that a little pill was controlling me, so I was the slave to the pill, I realized I didn't want to be a slave. Not to that. And I said, oh, not to anything, by the way. So I said, I gotta stop this. And that's it, that's the only way to stop it. You know, get support from loved ones around you, and I'll guarantee you, everybody will jump on. If you're in, an, in, in a toxic relationship, meaning if your partner is also using drugs, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to do it both yourself Best thing is, <laughs> yeah, it's a hard thing to say, but you're going to have to break up because if one falls back, chance that the other one falls back. You need to be very, very strong or just do that. Be, be very, very strong. And don't say after the weekend, I'm going to stop after this. Just tomorrow. It's the same with people signing up for a gym. You know, I'm going to sign up for a gym after the weekend. Why not tomorrow? Why don't you do that? Just start. You know, get, get it out of the way. Start. You know, and that's the thing. It's the only thing you have to do is make the first step. And once you make the first step, stick to it. And once you stick to it, your life is going to be so much better after all that crap is out of your life. I promise you. The whole new world opens up. Godspeed, everybody. And that means I wish you a prosperous journey in life. <laughs>